And now for part three of my interview with Dr. Lowry Stokes Sims, curator at the Museum of Arts and Design. I want to get back to your career path because when you left the Metropolitan right. Museum, you made a comment in a prior interviews saying people thought you were insane. You went to the Studio Museum in Harlem. Right. Why did you make that decision? Um, I think that it was a combination of efforts. I often called the Studio Museum my midlife crisis job <laughs> uh, because I think it was a lot of things. I had just finished my doctorate, I just turned 50, and my father had just died. And I guess I sort of looked at my life and I said, well, you know, you can continue on as you are or you can take um, a chance and do something new. And I think I really realized I needed to shake up my life because working at the Met was very familiar, very smooth. It was very gratifying. I mean, I had fought through all the things that I believed in. I saw everything moving into the system so that it was really changing. And I think I needed a new challenge. And I think the Studio Museum was just too irresistible. I don't, if it had been another museum, I don't know if I would have What attracted you to the Studio Museum? The Studio Museum, with its focus on the sort of global creativity of black people, had always been an important institution in my life. Working at the Met was terrific. But, you know, in the early days of the 70s when, you know, the art world wasn't that diverse, the Studio Museum was the place where I could go and I could meet my peers who were artists, who were curators, who were directors, who were administrators, and even dealers, you know. And so it was, it was like Harlem was like sort of like the Mecca. My mother had grown up in Harlem. Uh, she had ambivalent feelings about Harlem. Everybody had ambivalent feelings about Harlem. When the offer to direct the Studio Museum came in late 99, 2000, Harlem was on the cusp of just bursting out. And I felt that this was a terrific moment to bring all the things that I had learned to the museum, to the studio, which had, you know, sort of become very habitual. And I've been in institutions long enough to know that you have to shake them up ever so often. You have to look at your original mission and revise it ever so often. And the studio had just turned 30, and this was like a good moment to sort of look at what it was and what it should be in the future. Um, it also gave me an opportunity um, at my advanced age to work with younger people. Mm -hmm. And I really felt, uh, I really have very strong feelings about generational shift and change and paving the way for the young and turning it over to them so you can retire and <laughs> sit on the beach, you know, in that sense. And I knew that black institutions tended to be very patriarchal, matriarchal, and people hang on forever. And um, I had an opportunity to work with Thelma Golden and Sandra Well, let's talk Jackson. about Thelma Golden because yeah. that was your first hire right. when you went to the museum. Right. Was that your way of trying to shake up the organization? I think so, too. I mean, when I knew that the position was open, I had thought that the museum Museum would hire her, you know, in, in a sense. And I think that uh, what, the, what the, the search committee um, saw was that we really bought a set of very complementary skills to the museum um, at that moment. And when I went in, it was understood that I was only going to stay a set amount of time. I had sort of said five to seven years, depending on when their application for reaccreditation from the American Museum. Why is Museum. that? Because you wanted to foster this younger generation that Absolutely. you talked about? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I had never wanted to be a museum director per se, you know, because it's, it's a tough job. And I was really committed to curating. I loved working with artists and objects and writing articles and curating shows and just, you know, hanging out in art bars and things like that. So do you say it's a tough job being a museum director because you're dealing with fundraising, ad administration, fundraising, administration, the board. Right, and the museum, the studio museum at that point needed a lot of re-examining of everything from soup to nuts, from employment practices to finances to fundraising to sort of creating a vision to sort of really reflecting what the new Harlem was, but also reflecting what the new generations of African American and bl black artists globally were doing. And, the, you know, the museum had already always been international and had, under previous directors, you know, particularly under Mary uh, Schmidt Campbell, had done like really groundbreaking important shows. It had really done a lot to sort of establish itself as an institution, but it was sort of sitting there in idling, you know, and it needed to sort of get a jump shot jump shot to sort of move to the next phase. And so hiring Thelma and then also Sandra Jackson, who was our program person, 
Um, I think people sort of focus on me and Thelma as the dream team, but we could not have done it without Sandra, who really came in and set the program, and it was entirely complimentary. Um, and with that dynamic team, we moved this museum forward. Now, the Studio Museum has been widely called the crown jewel in the Harlem Renaissance. Right. Did you have any concerns, though, about the Harlem Renaissance? Because there has been a lot of criticism about right. the over-gentrification of Harlem. Exactly. I think that that is... Um, really always been a concern. And when we first went to Harlem, you know, certainly there was a ambivalent feeling around the interest in Harlem and the revitalization of Harlem. I call it the revitalization, because for me, the Harlem Renaissance is really a specific period in the <laughs> 20s and 30s. But um, I think that when you sort of look long term in, in the history of Harlem, it's always been a very polyglot very multicultural uh, community. Uh, one of my friends, Sandy Starkman, who is a designer, uh, I met him early on in my tenure at the Studio Museum, and he bought a house on the south side of Mount Morris Park on 120th Street that used to belong to the Salzberger family hmm. and of the New York Times. So, you know, it sort of reminds you that, you know, Harlem was a Dutch town. And it was connected to downtown by Broadway, which was an Indian trail. And they were two separate entities until, you know, the city filled in in the, in, in the interim. And that a lot of the, the reason why you have such magnificent architecture in Harlem is that at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, they were building these apartment houses for more affluent people. And then, you know, the politics of real estate and the dynamics of the um, demographics of the city changed. And, you know, for nefarious and less nefarious reasons, you know, that you had, you know, block busting and all that type of thing, and, and it sort of turned over and became very African American. But it's always had a very strong black community since the beginning of the 20th century that stayed there through all the trials and tribulations mm -hmm. the community had with drugs and crime, and particularly after World War II through the 1980s. Now you're at the Museum of Arts and Design as a right. curator. What attracted you to that institution? Well, um, I think I was attracted to it because um, I was intrigued by the way the museum was refitting itself and repositioning itself in the art world around the, dial the dialogue between concept and technique. And very often those are split into what we call art and crafts. And in my sort of simple-minded way, I always felt that great art had great craftsmanship, so I didn't see what the issue was. Um, it, would, it was also an opportunity to return to being a curator, mm -hmm. but also an opportunity to learn something because I had to sort of really um, sort of become much more conversant than I was in issues around the history of craft and around design, which is very exciting, and how all those works are converging, all those different genres are converging today in the art world. Do you think in this current economic climate that there might be a resurgence and return, if you will, to craftsmanship? I think there definitely is. And I think that that was also the very exciting part of joining the museum at this point. I mean, given the, f given the fact that I had, you know, been very close to the feminist art movement and how they brought things like sewing and quilting and mm -hmm. women's work into the art world and sort of wanted it into the sort of, you know, regular art discourse. The fact that I'd been very involved with, you know, artists of different, you know, ethnic and racial cultures that were, you know, making and objects were, you know, a kind of reflection of their desire to connect with their past and their ancestral legacies. It just makes sense, you know, for me to sort of really see how that broadens. And I was astonished when I first started in the art world and started going back to galleries after being a museum director mm -hmm. for, you know, almost six years, of how this whole um, action of making, obsessive making, of, you know, close work, of uh, translation of materials that you used to s associate with craft and and artwork has moved into the mainstream art world. And I find it totally fascinating in that sense. I mean, it's hard to find a great painter anymore because everybody's <laughs> cutting paper, you know, use, using ceramics, using metal, using fabric. I mean, it's, it's just really phenomenal how that's really changed. Well, let's talk about that because one of the most interesting things that I thought about the museum is these open studios where the right. viewer can actually interact with the artist. Why aren't more museums doing that? 
Oh, I think it's just rather space. And when I was at the, at the Metropolitan, I always would sort of say wistfully ever so often, do you think we could find a little corner where we could have artists do things? And see, when I was at, you know, a kid coming to the Met, they used to have what they called a junior museum on the ground floor. I mean, mm -hmm. now they have the Eurus Center, which is just a magnificent place and has a library and computer centers and, you know, education spaces. But the Junior Museum was like this kind of little funky space where you could go and push buttons and read signs and turn on lights and, you know, self, you know, educate yourself about materials and techniques. So it was terrific f introduction to the public. And, and even when I was teaching college courses, <laughs> I would send, you know, like introduction to art courses, I would send right. my students, I said, now go to the Junior Museum and, you know, <laughs> run through and they'd have to do a report. And then, you know, as the museum changed and they needed, you know, space to stage different visiting groups, that sort of went away. So, but I, I was, I guess that really sold me on this whole idea that people like to sort of know about the techniques that they have and that, you know, unless you took art courses like I did in high school, um, you don't have a sense of what goes into a painting or a ceramic vase or something like that. So, um, and going to the Studio Museum was, was another, that was, you know, like a real fulfillment of my desire to have that as an integral part of the museum operation because the museum is called the Studio Museum mm -hmm. because it's had an artist in residency program from its beginning. Right. What I had to do with that program was to take it off the office floor and the Monday through Friday and nine to five schedule, give them their own studios where the artists could come and go, uh, where they could have writers and gallerists in and integrate them into the education programming so that, you know, they could both work and, you know, have the solitude and quiet to work, mm -hmm. but at the same time interact with the public. The great thing about MAD is that, you know, you go to the sixth floor and we, we're very proud <laughs> that, you know, our education is <laughs> department's not on the ground floor. And then you, you, it's like, most of the real estate is given over to these studios. I was I was totally shocked because I wasn't involved in the planning of the museum. So as you know, the the building of the uh, the, the museum progressed, and we were doing hard hat tours. And, you know, the first time we came on the sixth floor, I went, "My God!" You know, I mean, <laughs> look at this space for making. So and, and it's it's an enormously popular um, part of the museum's operation with the public because they can get up. They can watch an artist do something, they can talk to them, it breaks down the barriers. It's a real visceral feeling, obviously. Absolutely.